and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at DaVita. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for panelists throughout the discussion. Please join us after the webinar for a guided meditation session with Casey Lane. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Renalytics AI, James McCullough. Well, thank you and thank you everybody for joining us uh, and our distinguished panels who hail from, uh, panelists who hail from a number of different backgrounds. This should be a very dynamic discussion with different viewpoints uh, that are coming in. My name is James McCullough and I'm Chief Executive Officer of Renalytics AI. Uh, we're a NASDAQ a listed company that is focused on uh, the front end of kidney disease, specifically precision medicine in kidney disease uh, progression. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, turn it over now to each of the panelists to introduce themselves and just talk uh, for one minute about uh, what they're doing uh, in the space. The title of this uh, discussion is the anti-status quo. Uh, disease prevention and disruptive care models. Uh, so we expect to have a lively discussion. Uh, Martha, can I uh, send it over to you, please, uh, to introduce yourself and, and give a quick background? Yes, of course. Uh, glad to be with you. I am the president and CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island. Uh, and we uh, are the largest insurer in the smallest state uh, in the nation. And our uh, mission is to passionately lead a state of health and well being for all uh, residents of Rhode Island. And so we've been very disruptive in the market and happy to talk more about that as we go. Raj, can we turn it over to you? Yeah, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Rajiv Shah. I'm a nephrologist at Intermed Consultants in Minneapolis, and I'm the founder and CEO of MyMeds. Um, what we do at MyMeds is we're personalizing the medication experience. Uh, because it's so foundational to value-based care. And we all know that as the world moves towards value-based care, it's focused on people with chronic conditions. And if we think about how do we impact the behaviors of people with chronic conditions, we recognize that the medications are such a big part of their lives. And if we can make it easier for the patients, their care caregivers, and the clinical teams that work with them, whether it's at the health plan or in the actual systems, then together we can all make everything better. But again, because this medication experience is so foundational to everything we do for preventing progression of disease, um, that's where we're really focused and excited uh, to be here today. Thank you. Terrific, and prevention and progression, uh, progression is very important. And obviously we'll get to the value-based uh, healthcare uh, discussion shortly, so it's so topical. Uh, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for join, for the invitation to join this great discussion today. My name is Jen Meyer. I'm the Chief Development Officer at Dispatch Health. And for those of you who don't know about Dispatch Health, we provide a system of high acuity care in the home in 31 markets, 19 states, soon to be 50 markets. We provide ER level care on demand safely to the home. In all of our markets, we're now starting to bring hospital level care to the home. We call that advanced care. So patients that we're seeing in that ER setting, if uh, they're, they're having a tough time stabilizing, we do need to move them uh, and escalate them to that higher level of care. We now can transition them seamlessly from that ER model to that hospital level care with the right DRGs, with the right approvals, with our risk bearing partners and our other community partners, we can transition them safely in the home. In my role specifically, I work with all of our risk bearing partners. So that includes our great uh, PCPs that are taking value-based care, is our health plan partners, is our health system partners that are taking risk and home health and anybody else that exists in the market that's focused on value-based care. Jennifer, thank you. Are you operating in Rhode Island? Not yet, but maybe Martha ah, and I will talk. Okay. <laughs> One of the big values of this panel. Uh, Misha, can you, can you bring us uh, home here? Thanks, James. Uh, it's great to be here. Good morning and afternoon to everyone. I'm Misha Palachek, and I'm the Chief Development Officer at DaVita, which 
many people probably know as a dialysis company, but we're going to talk about how we're a kidney care company today. And as part of my role, I work with teams who are going beyond dialysis. So we're working on value-based care, both for ESRD patients, but also importantly for CKD patients. And I'm looking forward to talking about that today. Very good. And as you know, Misha, obviously we're working on a partnership around the front end of the disease between renalytics and, uh, uh, and DeVita, which is a very progressive uh, partnership. And that moves us really into, we, we have a couple of questions here and we, we wanna keep this as a lively and open discussion. Uh, all of us have been in many Zoom uh, meetings and it's good to have a, a good back and forth with a few interruptions. Yeah. Uh, so let's please do that. But uh, the title of today's session is the, the anti-status quo. Uh, and that's something that is, as an entrepreneur who's grown up uh, venture financing and, and building new technologies, I'm something I'm very familiar with and very comfortable operating in. Uh, but Martha, I'd love to just hear your take on some of the things that you're doing, uh, which are anti-status quo. Uh, to really disrupt the space and begin to drive uh, the needed change that we, we've got to have in chronic disease management? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, what we have been working on uh, has been a long-term approach. We've been working with Brown University to develop uh, the Rhode Island Life Index, which really tries to measure how uh, Rhode Island residents are dealing with the social determinants of health. And so the really the only way to address some of the root causes that exist in our system, which have been just so amplified, I think, during the pandemic is to measure them. And so we're starting by measuring and then we invest very significantly in things like housing, uh, because if you don't have a roof over your head, it's hard to really take care of your health. One of the things that we've done that has been more disruptive is that we brought retail uh, clinics into the market. Um, we partnered with Oak Street Health. And um, by really changing how care was delivered and that holistic care uh, for our members, we were also able to drive change in the market. So now some of the incumbents have actually now followed suit and are offering very similar care. So I think there's a great opportunity to really reimagine how care gets delivered and push forward. We uh, enjoy 50% market share. So it gives us that density to really have an impact and work with our provider partners to drive and make change. And we're very focused on the health equity issues that uh, are very, um, uh, very clear and really trying to make a difference and disrupt what happens today so that they get better care. And, and health equity is such a critical issue. And we see this in, in our area in kidney disease, uh, disproportionately uh, burdened in uh, patients of African ancestry and Hispanic ancestry. Uh, I, I'm curious, just, just quickly, in terms of incubating these types of models, uh, the Rhode Island Life Index and uh, getting retail uh, clinics in place, is that easier in a state like Rhode Island? Is this really because of its uh, smaller capacity, you can really take a look at these on an incubated basis versus in a state like California? Um, I think it may be, and I think you can have examples in California where there has been great partnerships to drive real change. I, we've seen that with some of the work on maternal health and working with Medi-Cal um, on the doula programs there. So I think there's an opportunity everywhere, but it does take um, the right stakeholders, uh, and I think the patient density and member density and, and the folks to come together to try to have an impact. And so we are very fortunate, Rhode Island, to be a very compact state and have, and have that structurally. But I think you see it in other markets as well where disruption is happening. And Jennifer, this really ties into your business model as well when I think about this. Can you talk a little bit about how you're disrupting the status quo? Yeah. Well, when we think about disrupting the status quo, I was trying to put, you know, is there one single thing that we're doing? But I really think our entire business model is really changing the status quo. And you'll see, I, I purposely left out this word disruptor, because as I think about dispatch and the model that we're in, we are absolutely changing that status quo. We are bringing new levels of great care to our communities but we're doing it in a way that we're not disrupting some of those valuable relationships that exist in our markets today. So 
dispatch doesn't come in and disrupt the relationships that PCPs have invested in and built with their patients, that nephrologists have built with their patients. We don't come in and disrupt uh, Martha's great care teams that are proactively working on a patient population and trying to bring them everything that they need and get ahead of their care needs. But rather, with both of those groups and many other groups in the community, we work side by side with them so that as their populations have that high acuity event, that we create access to new things that um, can provide that high acuity care and also new settings. Traveling for everyone isn't very easy. And so you've got homebound patients, you have other individuals that really do struggle with getting uh, to that place of care. So we become another option in the community, but we really try and work closely together. Um, you know, when I was thinking a little bit about how, how are we really changing that status quo or why are we changing that? What's the problem we're solving? You know, I think uh, historically um, being able to bring on-demand services to the home has been particularly challenging. And when you complicate that further with bringing ER level services, it's really been next to impossible. Um, and so as we think about that, I think we've really had the benefit of two trends kind of coming into play really in the last five to seven years that have made it maybe a little bit more easy. Uh, the first is just technical advancements. Uh, we're seeing so many things that now uh, that needed to be just in that facility setting they become smaller, they become more mobile, they become more stable, so we can actually put them in vehicles and bring them safely to the home. The second aspect that we've seen, quite frankly, is just the technology that exists out there to bring on-demand services to the home. All day long in our communities, we're getting uh, things in an on-demand setting, services uh, or products to our homes. And so now we introduce queuing theory and clinical um, optimization, and you can actually risk stratify a patient population and be able to determine where do I have all of my clinical capabilities in a community, and can I get to that individual in the time that was needed? So as we think about uh, those new um, elements really coming into our communities, our founders really had the opportunity to redesign high acuity care squarely centered on the quadruple aim. So they started first with what are those great clinical capabilities that we can bring in the home to get great clinical outcomes. We can now have ultrasound that goes to the home. We can get hospital grade EKG reads right in the home. You know, we've got um, in all of our markets, we focused on lab capabilities and we have a moderately complex CLIA certified lab traveling to the home of patients in our communities. We looked at the procedures that we could do safely, and then we rounded it all out with the IV and oral pharmaceuticals that we can bring. And the second so element many, is- that, Jennifer, I'm Oh, yeah, sorry. curious. How many uh, homes do you actually have access to right now? Do you measure that as a metric? Have you disclosed that? Um, um, we look at it in a couple of uh, dimensions. So we certainly look at it in terms of the markets that we exist in today, and we've got 31 markets across 19 states. We do, in a community, look to work with all risk-bearing partners. So that's all health plan partners, that's anybody that's taking any downstream risk, and we also serve Medicare fee-for-service and Medicaid populations as well. We believe access is really important, and high acuity care at an affordable price point is really important. So very, very incredibly important, bringing that, breaking down those barriers, getting that technology available into mm -hmm. the homes, the highest quality of care, the most sensitivity of the diagnostics, et cetera, that's, that's critically important. I also love your point about, uh, I'll call it selective disruption, uh, so that we don't right. go in and bust up things that are already working, especially we talked about the relationship between the primary care physician and the patient, so critically important uh, to the entire healthcare chain. Misha, can I bring you into the conversation now? Because uh, I know Davida's got a lot of stuff uh, certainly that I've been exposed to, uh, which is very impressive, and you have uh, a lot of broad thinking going on. Yeah, and James, you'll be familiar with the status quo and the issues with the status quo, so I thought maybe I would start for those people in the audience that might not be as familiar with what the status quo issue is in kidney care and the progression of kidney care, and then talk about how 
we're trying to disrupt it with our partners, uh, such as Renalytics and other folks even on this phone. But the, the problem in kidney care is that uh, about 50% of patients who have chronic kidney disease don't know that they have chronic kidney, kidney disease. And the way they find out that they have to actually start dialysis is a super unfortunate thing, which is they find out when they get acutely sick and they end up in the hospital. And imagine a hospitalist or a nephrologist rounding on your bedside in a hospital and telling you, your kidneys no longer work, you need to do dialysis for the rest of your life. It's mentally traumatic for, for that patient and their family members. It's really bad care because that patient couldn't choose to do home modality up, upstream. Uh, they, they don't know uh, that they could have changed diets, they could have changed some of their lifestyle uh, in order to slow the progression to, di to dialysis. And then finally, it's, it's uh, really costly uh, to, to do care that way. And so uh, the disruption that we've been working on is how do we get further upstream with partners uh, in order to identify patients earlier uh, and start to act upon their kidney disease so that we can slow the progression. And if they ended up needing to do dialysis that we can help them do it in the right way and have a, a smooth plan uh, start. So I'll just give one quick example uh, of how we're doing this. We, we recently signed a partnership because we don't think we can do this alone. I'll talk a bit about nephrologists, but also uh, pair partners are critical uh, to us doing this. And we signed a really um, exciting partnership with Blue Cross Blue Shield in Minnesota, where we're going to be caring for about 20,000 CKD patients all the way upstream to CKD. CKD is chronic kidney disease, and it's defined in five stages. Typically, the first three stages are sort of in the primary care space. And then CKD four and five, which we call late stage CKD, is where nephrologists start to intervene. Anyway, we have about 20,000 patients from CKD one through three that we'll be working with primary care physicians in the broader community on. And then late stage CKD, which we'll be working with nephrologists and the health systems in order to try to slow the progression, prevent some of these crashers, and then improve the care that these patients have. So, that, so that's really the disruption. We're hoping that over time, James, and, and for the rest of the panelists, that 50% that, that number is gonna dramatically decline. No, absolutely. And we're going to get in trouble if we if we stick too much to kidney disease here, because there's a much broader subject matter. But kidney disease is uh, near and dear to us. 37 million Americans with existing kidney disease and 50 percent of the patients who end up on hemodialysis when their kidneys fail, they do it through the an emergency room entrance and they haven't seen a specialist, at least in, in the last year. So you're talking about a huge disease population, which is clinically upstaging, and then they end up crashing into an emergency room uh, dialytic event. That's not the way that we need to be managing such large population groups uh, with chronic disease. And of course, we're involved in, in tackling that issue. Uh, Raj, I'm gonna shift just a little bit uh, away from disruption and you, you brought up the issue of value-based care and I'm gonna put you on the spot. Uh, now, can you please define value-based care? What is value-based care? Yeah, you know, I think um, the, the way we see value-based care um, is really the focus on people with chronic conditions, right? People with chronic conditions are growing every year. I think there's, you know, 60% of the country has at least one chronic condition now. And so the numbers are growing every single day. But those are the people that are driving the biggest costs in healthcare. And so for years, it's all been focusing on prevention of disease to begin with and focusing on the healthy, but that's 80% of the people, but they're only 20% of the cost. And when we look at the other 20% that are, you know, 80% of the cost, we need to think about how do we impact them so they can be healthier because they're going to get better outcomes if we prevent them from progressing. And so when I think of value-based care, I look at this entity up here. And then I think we need to focus on the people who have chronic conditions. And then within those people with chronic conditions, what are we gonna do to help them? And it's diet, it's fitness, but we know that only works for some of the people. And so we have to focus on medications, right? Because medications are part and parcel of their lives. And if we don't get them to take their meds properly, then we're not going to slow down progression of disease. We're not gonna allow them to achieve wellness. 
And so that's really how I look at the whole continuum of things of, you know, value-based care is where we all want to go because it's all based on outcomes, better outcomes, better health, lower cost. It's focusing on chronic conditions and people who have them, but then it's recognizing what can we do to interfere um, with that progression. And, and that's really, that's another disruption if you think about it, because the system, the healthcare system has not been patient-centric. The healthcare system has been system-centric and doctor-centric and patients just happen to be part of it. But if we're really gonna disrupt this, what we have to do is empower patients and their caregivers with education and tools that make sense to them. We have to bring clinical teams in and give them data that's actionable, right? And it has to happen now because if we're trying to prevent disease, you know, with 50% of people crashing into dialysis, if we knew, you know, six, 12, 18 months before that these are the people that are having issues with their meds. These are the people who have high blood pressure. If we can get to them sooner, we can make a huge difference. And so, you know, kind of going back to your last question too, but like the disruption part for me is there's technology disruption, there's care model disruption, but there's also people disruption. And in this case, the people who are disrupting healthcare are the patients by giving them education, giving them tools to succeed. And it's pharmacists, because when you think about value-based care, and as I just talked about, the medication aspect of what we do, pharmacy is the fastest growing part of healthcare spend. And we have experts, doctors in pharmacy who aren't being enabled at their fullest extent. So I did a TED talk six years ago and I was kind of crazy. It's called, it was called the new disruptors in healthcare patients and pharmacists. And what I talked about is technology is disrupting, but if we enable patients and their caregivers with education and personalization, because that's how you change behavior, got to make it important to me. Then you bring in the pharmacists who are the experts in this. That's how we're really going to change everything as a team where you got patients, physicians, other clinical members and pharmacists working together to do it. So I know it was a long answer, but no, we could probably go on for four hours. It's interesting. You mentioned the, uh, the key issue here, uh, which is behavior change, which for me, sitting in precision diagnostics and prognostics uh, at the front end of disease states, trying to understand progression rates, uh, response, clinical workflows, et cetera, that's the holy grail and is the most elusive. How do we get to behavior change, not only with the physician, but also with the patient? Very difficult, as opposed to just giving them a pill. Yeah. And I think, you know, so my background is cognitive psychology with a focus on memory. And so this is something I've been doing for a long time. And when it is giving them a pill, what happens in today's world is you come and see me. I talk to you about what you have. I've got 15 minutes. So I'm not going to go into super detail. And then I'm going to prescribe a medicine. Now i as a kidney guy, I know like 30 meds, but there's probably 30,000 meds, right? So I know what I know, but I don't know the rest. So I send a prescription to the pharmacy, you go get it. They offer you that five second, hey, do you wanna to talk to me in this private window right here? And you're like, no, I gotta go, right? Yeah. And you go home. Now they staple a bottle into a bag, a ream of paper attached, here, read this. What's the first thing you do? You get home, you rip it up and recycle that stuff. Now you got a bottle, right? That bottle sits there and then you say, all right, now I have questions. I can call my doctor, but we know it's going to take three or four days. I can call the pharmacy, but the pharmacist is super busy. So I'm not going to get super good attention. So people turn to Dr. Google. And when they talk to Dr. Google, they get all sorts of info. But the whole point of the behavioral change when it comes to medications is personalization. So if you take a tenolol, but you don't know why, it's just a pill. If you take a blood pressure medicine, but you don't know the name, it's just a pill. But if you take a tenolol and you know you take it for high blood pressure and you're taught through education that controlling your blood pressure prevents a heart attack or a stroke, now that's important to me because I don't want to have a heart attack or a stroke. So what happens now, a tenolol, or blood pressure triggers your hippocampus to start creating memories. 
Then you give them the picture of the pill so they know, all right, this month it's white, next month it's pink, next month it's green, it changes. And then you give them education that's written in English, not medical. And then it's personalized to them because that personalization is the first step of long-term behavioral change. Martha, what's, what's your reaction to this? Uh, you're sitting on the payer side and you're writing the checks uh, for this, which means you really got to get down to the brass tacks of what is behavior change? What is this value-based healthcare thing? How do we drive utility, health economics, behavioral economics? What's, what's going through your head? Well, I agree with a lot of what Raj just said. Uh, I think there's also a step before that, though, because there's such a lack of awareness in the example of kidney disease that patients even have kidney disease, and there's not the right screening necessarily going on, particularly for patients of color. So a lot of people don't even get to the clinician who then prescribes the med to go through that whole chain. So I think there's so much opportunity to bring forward the awareness. Um, and I've had the opportunity to see a lot of what Davida does on the patient education side, which is, I think, so important for then in a very simple way without, you know, so addressing all those health literacy challenges, but just with simple pictures explaining uh, what the problems are and what they should go and get tested and what how to be advocates for themselves and empower them to be more active in their care. And so I think as a pair, we have the ability to take our data and push our provider partners to do more of that screening that's going to help people understand the conditions they face. And then we have an obligation to then bring to them the kind of care uh, and push uh, the market and, 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 and everybody today, it is broken, right? Kidney care is broken. So we have to drive change. And I think we have uh, both an opportunity and obligation to help people have that visibility and then have the tools to then take action. So I, I think it's so much about behavior change and we gotta change the whole system. Yeah, just to add to that, um, you know, I think as we think about this, I think we really have to move from delivering care to someone to delivering care with someone. And I think both Martha and Rajiv had elements of that um, in the way that they are responding, but it's such a, it's a small nuance but it really talks about changing a patient and changing their behavior, changing them from being passive in their healthcare to being active and knowing what are the couple of metrics that I need to monitor on my health. How many times a day or how many times a month do I need to uh, uh, measure that? And then importantly, where do I need to involve my care team? Where do I not understand? Where does it look like one of my metrics is kind of falling a little bit out of line? so that we can get those care teams in and engage much earlier and often. We see this um, quite a bit in our hospital level care at home, our advanced care program, because we're working side by side with someone for 30 days in their home. In that initial period, we're really stabilizing their care and getting them um, you know, out of that acute phase, but then we stay with them for 30 days and we're right there engaging with them every day, making sure that their health is really in line, making sure that they don't have readmissions while they're in that program. And we really see by being in the home that we can start to move those patients from passively thinking about their care to getting in front of it and really engaging in their health care. So and I would just say, James, if I, if I yeah, can, if I, Je, yeah. Jen just said, as a payer, what do you care more about except avoiding hospitalizations? The only thing you avoid, you know, that you want to avoid more is people progressing to very serious diseases, right? So it's like, if you can, as a payer, both bring down the cost of care that people are getting, but also really affect the number of people who get to these late stages and have very high costs, that's what we ultimately want. We want costs to go down and we want people to get better care. Uh, it's just a, it's a really good um, impact for us as a payer for the individual and for the whole uh, system. And so we're talking about a lot of complex dynamics. I mean, it's utterly fascinating discussion. We're hitting the, the key points of how you start to ultimately change the status quo here. Part of it is going into the home, getting the patient engaged, uh, Misha bringing you back in this journey because we've had this experience in kidney disease, which has really been a, uh, you know, since Richard Nixon extend, created the first socialized medicine program for an organ by extending Medi Medicare coverage for dialysis, which kicked this whole thing off. 
Yeah. Uh, but it really has not been an end-to-end -end based solution. It hasn't started as Jennifer's talking about in the home. It hasn't focused as Martha is talking about how do we prevent this movement into the later stages of chronic uh, disease and uh, hospitalization. Of course, what Raj is talking about behavioral change blows my mind. What what do we what are you what is Davida doing? What are you doing here to make sure that we start to coordinate all these elements to look at an end-to-end -end solution? But you know, it's one thing that's interesting about this panel and just listening to all the great comments that are being made, it, I think it highlights the need for collaboration in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, under a fee for service world, I think that we've for too long in, in, in the United States done healthcare in a siloed way. And that the key to sort of changing this on behalf of patients is for people like those on this panel to work together because in order to intervene and find the CKD patients upstream, you've got to work with the pairs, with the Marthas of the world. You want to collaborate with people that are doing med management in a different way and, and engaging patients differently. The stuff that Jen's doing and some of the technology she's bringing in the house sounds really, really interesting. And so for us, it really is about collaborating. And I'll just mention for, for us in kidney care specifically, you know this, James, but you know, nephrologists are really at the center of the care model and they are the quarterbacks of the care and so we've been working really hard to develop um it's it's one thing to be in a dialysis center it's another thing to be collaborating sort of bringing tools um to nephrologists that they can use to help the care of ckd patients and i love the word that you used earlier which is selective disruption don't disrupt stuff that's working which is nephrologists are, are working they're doing a good job when they get the right incentives and the right tools in order to manage CKD patients. And so I'll just mention sort of one, one other thing that I think has been a big game changer in terms of CKD care over the last five years. And so you mentioned 37 million Americans that we know of who have CKD or live with CKD. It turns out that a vast majority of those, 36, you know, 35 million of those are CKD one through five. Um, and, and a very small number of those, 700,000 actually get dialysis and only just over a million of them are CKD four and five. And so using big data and predictive algorithms in order to understand where to intervene makes, makes things a lot easier than they were five years ago. And so just as an example, we've been working on our, uh, you know, we're fortunate enough to have a bunch of data and we have a team that works on predictive algorithms and I'll just mention two that we use. One is in collaboration with pairs, you can actually take data. And this is with about 72% um, accuracy. You can predict patients who are not currently diagnosed with CKD and, and get them to take a lab test. And they, with 72% accuracy, they are in fact CKD patients who should be in the care model. And so you can start to identify these patients that don't know that they're living with this asymptomatic disease and, and get them access to the right care. And then just another, uh, a second one on the predictive analytics is this is with about 75% accuracy and these models continue to learn. And so as you get more and more patients on them, they're gonna get more accurate, but you can do what Raj talked about, which is you can predict a late stage CKD patient who is going to likely gonna need dialysis in the next six to 18 months and you can start to get them the right care. And of course, that's right, James, where your company is working too with Renalytics upstage, which is, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll let you can describe it better than I can, uh, this, this innovative progressive partnership, but it's trying to get upstream to try to predict which patients are likely the ones that need the most intensive care to slow the progression. So I'll, I'll stop. Uh, let's see if no, these are great. I, I've got about 15 questions. Unfortunately, we've only got another uh, 10 minutes and I want to open up to the audience. But some of the points you brought up are critical. Obviously, I came out of the cancer world where precision medicine, uh, personalized medicine was practiced beautifully and has had incredible consequences for many terminal cancers, which have now been turned into chronically managed diseases. And when we walked into kidney disease in 2017, there was effectively no precision medicine being practiced on the front end of this massive disease funnel. So we're very much about identifying using biomarker driven strategies out of blood with data analytics very early, starting in stage one, who is progressing, who should you focus on? But uh, this is an interesting uh, segment. I've got uh, two other questions for the panel and then we should probably move. I see a whole sequence of questions popping up from the audience, which is great. We've got good engagement here and some good questions. Uh, just quickly, uh, let's do around the horn 
uh, quickly, and we'll start with you, uh, Martha. When you look at technology uh, in healthcare, uh, can you tell me uh, at the top of your list, what, is, what are the technologies that you see coming online now or in the near future, which are gonna have the most impact uh, for the patient? Yeah, I think predictive analytics, as we were just talking about, are so critical of the ability to identify patients who are high risk, but not yet high cost. We're trying to get that information, use our data, and then get it into the hands of clinicians at the point of care, because that's where it's really important to have the insight. Um, so that I think is coming a long way. Um, I think the ability to do more of the kind of diagnostic testing that you all are doing as well is helpful. I, you know, I think we probably all will say telehealth because it's been such a sea change this year. I think many of us have worked on trying to get telehealth to take uh, root for 15, 20 years and we're, it's now here. It has had a tremendous impact on behavioral health through this pandemic when there has been so much need. And so I think that's something that um, really is changing how we reach um, communities of need, individuals of need. Um, so I think it's technology. And then I go, come back a little bit to the tool side of measurement. We got to measure uh, what we're doing. We got to measure the gap so that we can address it and bring even more new technology to bear. Jennifer? Yeah, you bet. Uh, well, we are watching technologies all day long, seeing what's getting smaller, what we can get in the home. But maybe a different angle that I'd actually take on this um, that maybe many don't know about us, but we're actually watching really closely what technologies that exist specifically around gap closure. Um, you know, obviously a lot of folks are really close with this. EMR structures um, haven't traditionally allowed clinicians to really know what exact gaps need to get closed. And so we're seeing a lot of new platforms really come into this uh, space that are surfacing information for providers to actually take action when they're with that patient. We're in the home on our senior population just about 54 minutes. So we think a lot about um, when we have that engagement, our primary reason is to be there and to support them in that high acuity event. But how do we create a richer experience really around their total health? And so understanding, you know, if there are certain gaps um, to close, whether um, uh, old and or if there's social determinants of health is a big aspect for us. And the final thing that we think a lot about is how do we integrate that into our clinical workflows? I think the more that we have separate systems, it gets very complicated and hard for providers to do that. So we think about those technologies and then we think about how do we embed that in our clinical workflows. Misha? I think that was all you got, I won't be repetitive. I think the clinical workflows that you said, but I'll add another one to it. Is, um, I think digital engagement of patients is gonna be critical because how do you reach the patients? You know, we're super fortunate with ESRD end stage patients. We, we see them in our clinics, we see them in our home modalities, and it's harder to do that when you when you don't have that kind of access to patients. So I think digital engagement with patients is going to be critical over the next five years. I couldn't agree with you more. And as we get deeper into the kidney space, sorry to bring it back to kidney, but it is such a fascinating model uh, because I think it, there are parts of it that are wide open. Uh, most of our dialogue is very much on the front end with the primary care physician and around the behavioral economics, that irrational communication between what goes on at the primary care, what Jennifer's talking about in the home with the patient engagement, because 80% of the existing chronic kidney disease is actually managed at the primary care level. We only have 10, 11,000 nephrologists, specialists. This is a massive imbalance between 40 million Americans with disease and only a limited pool of specialists. So it's got to be, as Jennifer says, in the home. It's got to be with the primary care physician enabling us with technology that we have at our disposal. Uh, Raj, anything to add on the technology front? And then I've got a special question for everybody. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing with technology is just interoperability, right? Because right now, the one thing you can't have is a million apps and a million tools for everybody. And I think that the ability to have, you know, the, the, the experience that you're trying to get. There's a lot of best in class solutions and everyone's got their front end, right? And so when we're thinking about technology, you have to have the interoperability and 
you know, we do this at MyMeds where we have our own branded concept, but we have APIs of everything so that people can still get the best in class experience. It just comes through their platform. And I think when you're talking about patient engagement and things like that, that's important because they don't wanna be inundated with a bunch of different stuff. The other thing around technology that we have to remember is everyone thinks an app is the answer and it's not, right? Because when you're talking about value-based care, when you're talking about kidney care, you're talking about older people. Older people don't use apps. This is a phone for them, right? So they use tablets, they use web-based tools, their caregivers might use apps, but you gotta be omni-channel in what you're thinking. Because if you're not, you're going to lose, and you're losing with the population that matters the most. You, you bring up such a critical issue. Unfortunately, I'm sure many of the audience members that we've experienced this, I had to walk my mother, who was in her 80s, through the vaccination website. And I'm out here in Park City. She's in Connecticut. And I can tell you that was a two-day process. And of course, the anxiety and the emotional components associated with this, especially around the vaccination. I saw the, the significant limits of the technology when reaching really where, where's the chronic disease population. It's mostly in the older group. Now that will eventually resolve over time because my four-year-old daughter is teaching me how to use the iPhone, but it's, uh, it's gonna take a little bit of time. Uh, I, we have a couple more minutes. I'm gonna ask the panelists one more question here, which is one of my favorites. Uh, but before I do, I'd just like to remind the audience members, we've got a lot of questions coming in. Please uh, put the questions down. We're going to try to get to them as many uh, as we can. Uh, and don't hold back. We're interested in uh, interesting questions, uh, controversial questions, something that's exciting to listen to. So please go to your uh, Q&A box on Zoom and, and load them in and we'll take a look at them. Uh, final question for you. Uh, Unfortunately, most of my great experience has come from mistakes. And I've built several companies and I now have a long list of mistakes that I've made, uh, some of which have been catastrophic, uh, some of which have been uh, mildly okay, uh, but I keep this list of mistakes next to me. And I won't make those mistakes in Renalytics because I've already made those, I'll make new mistakes. But uh, this is the, the function of wisdom as you get into understanding how you actually affect change in healthcare. Uh, Martha, can you just, and we're going to take 30 seconds, 45 seconds each. Uh, can you think of a mistake that you've made, which has now been a substantial contributor to your business strategy going forward? Yes. And I love the question. I think the biggest thing I would point to are times when I've listened more to internal strategic objectives and not enough to the voice of the customer and what people really need. That's a good one. Jennifer? Yeah, you bet. Um, you know, my biggest mistake, I think, was actually not getting into healthcare earlier. I'm not a clinician. I didn't come from a family that was particularly connected to healthcare, and I kind of discounted myself out of uh, really having an impact in healthcare. I had a great mentor uh, when I was at a consulting firm that had a healthcare uh, uh, client, and so I joined that study, and I fell in love with healthcare. There's so many intellectual problems to solve. There are so many things that uh, really need a diverse set of backgrounds. Um, and I've also just found the power of working side by side with clinicians. I've done that now for 20 years and I've just loved it. So don't discount yourself uh, just because you might not have a background that seems like uh, it applies to a certain uh, aspect of uh, an industry. Raj, give us a good one. So I, I would tell you, you know, my experience comes in two ways. One is in the medical world, right? So when I was in med school, that's when I saw it happen, right? That decisions were always made by the most senior person, even if they were wrong. And surgery is the perfect example of that, where it's the complete hierarchy of stuff. So if you disagreed, you were shut down, or people just never said anything because they were afraid, right? And then the thing that sucked is that the patients took a hit. And it's not like they were dying or anything, but something that didn't have to happen happened because of ego. And then I saw the same thing in business that when the, whoever has the highest ranking title gets to speak, right? They always have the floor and then people are afraid to speak up for whatever reason. And that was one thing I realized that when you make ego-based decisions, you always lose. And one of the things going back to what Martha said, when we designed my meds, we didn't design in a box. 
we literally met with thousands of patients and caregivers, hundreds of physicians and pharmacists to understand what they wanted. Because we know what we think, but in the medical world, doctors have one opinion, nurses have another opinion, patients have another opinion, caregivers have another opinion, insurers have another opinion, providers of clinical things have different opinions. But the most important thing is if we put the patient in the middle and listen to their voice, that's how we're going to change stuff. So taking ego out and keeping it patient focused. Without a doubt, and I learned a very important lesson when I trained as a pilot uh, early on before I got into medicine, and we used a method called uh, cockpit resource management, which was put in place because of a lot of crashes that occurred in the 60s and 70s, because the captain said, this is what we're doing. And the first officer would say, that's not a good idea. But the captain said you could do it. So they uh, put a system in place in the cockpit so that the first officer could speak up when the captain was doing something stupid. Uh, Misha, please uh, finish this off. Sure. Well, first, anyone who's worked with me for even a short amount of time knows that there's plenty of mistakes to choose from. But as I was trying to think of something that would kind of circle back with this panel and our discussion, I kind of came, I came up with a big regret. And that regret is that I, I believe that the value-based medicine that we are bringing is going to make a huge difference for patients and that we've been living in this siloed world for too long. And I regret that I have not personally leaned in harder over the last 15 years of trying to get collaborations going and more value-based care partnerships um, formulated. And we're starting to pick up some speed, but we have a long way to go. And so anyone who's in healthcare, I think, I think we need to all lean in uh, and break down the silos and sort of get this done because it's, it's, it's a big deal. I, I personally experienced it about 10 years ago with a family member that was, uh, you know, he, he fell to the, to the disjointed fragmented system. And so it's personal for me to try to get this done. And, and so I, that's my regret is have I done enough uh, personally over the last 10 years to try to get this system changed. So uh, um, I will lean in more over the next five to 10 years to get that done. It's a good point. Uh, we're going to shift to audience questions as I've got so many good questions here. I don't know where to start, but I think we should keep our answers uh, uh, sharp and pointy uh, and, and short so that we can get to many questions as possible. Uh, and I'm actually going to start with one very interesting question. Uh, which is involved around trust. Uh, how do you generate trust in behavioral change? That, I love that question because, and this goes back to what you've been talking about, Jennifer, what you've been talking about, Raj. Uh, if you don't have the patient trust and when you're introducing new technology, if you don't have the clinician trust, it's a tree falling in the woods. So Jennifer, I'll start with you and keep it short, but how do we develop that trust? Yeah, well, I do think setting up care uh, obviously is a big thing in that trust. Being in someone's uh, home setting, um, in the comfort of um, uh, where they reside every day, you can have a little bit deeper, a little bit more intimate conversations there. You can also probe on uh, different things. When you ask social determinants of health questions about food insecurity, it's a different conversation when you're there in someone's home and you're seeing evidence um, that might be a little bit contradictory to what they might be saying. So I think that's an important thing is as we work together in healthcare, none of us can do this alone, but how do we think about um, uh, the setting of care as a part of that uh, bigger solution? Really interesting. And Martha, this ties into what you talked about uh, with the Rhode Island Life Index and providing housing. These are fundamental issues. What, how do we develop that trust? Yeah, I, uh, I believe it's about really having empathy to start with and listening really well. And I think if you start by understanding where the patient is coming from or the member is coming from, then you can better meet those needs. And I think you first have to listen and then you have to deliver something of value to that member or patient. And once you do that and you help them with the problem that they're focused on, then I think you earn the trust to address the issues that you as a clinician or you as a payer think need working on. And Misha, we're starting this whole conversation uh, dialogue now with the Biden administration about uh, corporate uh, responsibility. Here you are in the 
big bad corporation making a lot of money in a, a for-profit situation, what do we do to develop trust? Yeah, well, I, I think Martha hit on it, which is I, if you can um, consistently deliver differentiated care that's meeting the needs of the patient and, and their family members, I think the consistency of it um, will, can, can over time develop trust, but it takes time and it takes consistency. It takes time and it takes consistency and you have to uh, work with the education. I see Casey's getting ready here on the video. Uh, Raj, any, any quick comments on trust? No, I think Martha, you nailed it, right? Because the most important thing when you're building trust is listening and responding. Because if you do what someone is asking and you follow up on it, that's the building block. And it's just talking and listening. And once you have trust, you can do anything after that, but you have to focus on them first. And that, you nailed it on that. It was awesome to hear. Another question from Kelly, uh, which I also love. What percentage of kidney care patients do you estimate could avoid significant long-term care with improved diet and exercise? I'm trying to understand how behavioral science could impact chronic disease numbers. And Kelly, from my perspective, uh, it is all about getting in the front end of the disease and understanding progression and risk. And these are the lessons we've learned from prostate cancer, lung cancer, brain cancer, where I started, that we're trying to translate with renalytics into the kidney disease space. But Misha, could you talk a little bit about the percentages and how much of this could we actually avoid? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And the two biggest precursors are the two biggest comorbid conditions that drive the demise of your kidney are turns out to be diabetes and hypertension. And so if you can change your lifestyle and you can avoid becoming a diabetic and or control your hypertension, you, we would significantly reduce the numbers of people that need dialysis. Not, not everybody, but we could significantly reduce the number of Americans who need dialysis. And so I, I do think that um, behavior change upstream, as you mentioned, James, uh, motivating people around diet and exercise and, and lifestyle could be a big game changer. I don't know what the numbers will be, but it will be quite dramatic. Of course, yeah, we're, we're seeing real real world evidence of that, right, in the U.S. over the last 10, 10 20 years. In, in our real world evidence uh, studies, we're now seeing uh, patients and primary care physicians saying, yeah, we need this information. Uh, we're, we're motivated to do it. Martha, you're footing the bill on this. Uh, how, how, how much do you think we can make an impact here? What, how, many, how many people do you think can we prevent from moving on? Uh, well, I think, um, and maybe Raj can help me here, but um, you know, I think over half of patients who progress uh, to end-stage renal disease, um, it, it's basically due to diabetes and hypertension that aren't managed where the meds aren't being taken or the lifestyle changes aren't being met. And so I think you could think about a big portion of that 50% that if you got to them earlier, they had awareness of their disease, they had the right access to a nephrologist and they got on the right care regime, or even earlier to your comment, they got the right care from a PCP uh, and they were coordinating their care with other specialists, they could really change that trajectory. We've seen it as everybody I think knows in metabolic syndrome, where if you can connect with patients before they have diabetes and help them change, they can avoid actually progressing to diabetes. And so, but we have to start with the awareness of kidney disease because we don't even have that baseline of the data that says who has it. And, and so I think there's like a starting point before we can start uh, avoiding the high cost. Raj, real quick. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as a clinician, I'd say, I would love if diet and fitness would be the answer, right? Because we wouldn't need people to take meds. We wouldn't need to, I wouldn't need to see them quite frankly, if they did. And, um, but the reality is diet and fitness probably impacts less than 10% of people, right? And the idea, once you have been diagnosed with high blood pressure, diabetes, the ability to come off meds is there, right? We see this all the time when people lose weight, they exercise, their sugars get better, the blood pressure gets better, and they can come off the meds, and that slows progression almost completely. But in reality, it's probably a less than 10% of the people can actually do that. The elusive behavioral change. 
the holy exactly. grail if we can get there. Uh, and people and just like to eat. People, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, it's one of the reasons I live at altitude. It helps me uh, helps me manage that. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask one more uh, question. I'd like to start with you, Misha. And this comes from Josh. Uh, with all the new investments into new startups, organizations, care models that focus on narrow verticals, uh, which you have to do if you want to raise money, right? You've got to have a narrow vertical that you're adding a differential advantage to. Uh, how do we ensure we don't impact care coordination? And I think this the reason I, I want to go to you, Misha, is because you've talked about collaboration, you've talked about partnership. Certainly, my experience with DeVita is uh, uh, very open and progressive in terms of the partnering, and we can't do it alone, as you said. Yeah. Uh, how, how do we avoid this? Because a lot of the venture uh, funding that's going into startups yeah. uh, it is, in fact, narrow. How do you get to that, that point where you don't impact care coordination? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a great question. I think it's very, very tricky. And I'll go back to, I love the word that you use, which is uh, selective disruption uh, is one, which is you need to figure out where you're disrupting and then making sure, I think the other one, the word that we used today was interoperability, which is making sure that you're actually connecting to the ecosystem of providers who are, who are caring for the patients. And, you know, I, I, I uh, the payers have a tough job, right? Martha's job is really tough because at the end of the day, she's going to see a bunch of people who are trying to get into narrow verticals and she needs to, and her, and their organizations need to make sure that the patient populations are being cared for sort of more holistically. And so how do you put those pieces together? I think in some ways in, in kidney care, um, we, we have a little bit of a unique position, which is we can partner with people um, like Dispatch Health, like My Meds and others, uh, and sort of weave it together and bring the package to a pair. And in other instances, the pairs are gonna have to figure out how to do that. So, so, so that would be my answer to the great question. And Jennifer, you were the one who really teed me up for the selective disruption. Uh, so thank you. Uh, but, and, and you're also running yeah. uh, Dispatch Health. I don't know how you finance, but I'm sure you've run to these issues. How do you prevent yourself yeah. from getting so narrow you don't fit into the system? That's right. Yeah, and I think, I, I mean, I think that Misha had a nice answer there about interoperability and us all working together. I mean, quite frankly, patients uh, and each one of us individuals, we think about our health, um, we're each a puzzle. Um, and we have all these individuals that are touching us and that have different puzzle pieces um, that are part of that total picture. And I think as we operate in this space, we, you have to be good at the area that you're in, but you also have to remember that you are a piece of that puzzle. And how are you contributing a unique view on that patient so that we can really manage comprehensive health and manage that patient's health um, uh, really well? So I think to the extent that we all think about that and we think about us all interlocking together, we are gonna achieve better outcomes in the industry. No, so true. And I think with Kidney Intellex, our lead prognostic product for early stage progression in CKD, I think of it as a solution. We know how to build mm -hmm. a vitro diagnostic, but it's the behavioral economic inputs, it's the clinical workflow inputs, it's how it fits into the system. So we really look at this as a solutions-based approach. That's what makes the difference between driving utility, outcomes, health economics, et cetera. Uh, Raj, thoughts on that? Oh, you're on mute, Raj. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the whole idea, it goes back to interoperability, right? Because you've got all these startups, including ours, getting funded um, in our verticals, as you say. But the reality is that if you create yourself in a way that's interoperable with APIs, again, you can create best of class um, solutions together. And that enables that care coordination to happen where they're still using their overall platform and system. You're just plugging and playing to make sure that they're getting the right data. And, and I think that's the key is getting the right data to the right people at the right time about whoever it is. It, it all goes to interoperability. Interoperability is so important because if it doesn't communicate, you get in doesn't trouble. Matter. We have about 30 seconds left. I'd just like to go around and on a scale from one to 10, as we're seeing the light at the end of the COVID tunnel, <laughs> and we're emerging, how optimistic are you about the near-term future of healthcare 
for our patients in the United States. Martha? Can I just chime in on the last question really quickly, which is I think clinical and financial accountability is really important in addition to interoperability, because then that entity is going to work with the other folks and coordinate care. But I'm quite optimistic coming out of uh, COVID. I think we have this opportunity to meet the challenges and all of the things that have been so clearly demonstrated in the inequities, we can come back and build the system back better. Jennifer, five seconds. A 10. If you're gonna change healthcare, I think you gotta have a 10. Raj? I totally agree, I'm a 10. <laughs> Misha? James, I'm a 10. CKD care is gonna improve, I'm a 10 on it. We are at the revolutionary point of CKD. Precision medicine revolution is entering therapeutically, service-wise, and prognostic. I'm a 10 too. Thank you so much. This has been a terrific discussion, engaging. Thank you to the audience members. Really appreciate your questions, and I apologize we couldn't get to them all. I wish we had another hour. Please, everybody, be safe. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you to James and to all of our panelists. If you'd like to continue the conversation, please join us on Twitter. And now, take a break from your day with a meditation session with Casey Lane. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I always so appreciate um, the opportunity to sit in on uh, the last 10 minutes. I'm always fascinated by the conversations that happen on these Zoom. So thank you for being here. For those of you who have the time, I'm going to take us through a 15 minute guided meditation. And before I get started, I always like to offer up the incredible benefits of meditating consistently and to also set up the expectation that it might not, you might not feel the benefits in real time, you might, but knowing that the choice to mindfully tune in and check in with yourself benefits the brain and memory and self-regulation and all sorts of incredible brain studies that coincide with meditating. So before we get started, one of the biggest misconceptions of meditation is this idea that you are not supposed to think about anything and it's going to feel just totally peaceful and that if you're doing it right, you float away on a cloud of meditative, thoughtless energy. And the reality is, brains are designed to think for us. So what is often referred to as the monkey mind or mind chatter, what am I having for lunch later? Oh, I need to remember to send that email, replaying a conversation that happened yesterday, right? The chattering of the mind is extremely common. And the goal of meditation is to become the observer of those thoughts rather than running away with them or letting them kind of control us, right? So I bring this up to say, as we move into this meditation, if you do notice that you have a lot of thoughts or that your mind is wandering, that is part of it and that is okay, right? The goal is hopefully we have moments where the mind stills, but more often than not, we will notice it swinging and chattering and that is totally fine. I would offer up this visualization of standing on a sidewalk and watching two lanes of traffic going by, right? You might notice sometimes there are a lot of cars, there might even be a traffic jam. Sometimes a car is loud and it honks. There may be moments where there are not any cars at all, right? And these cars represent our thoughts. And so as we come back to the breath, as we come back to the focus of our meditation, which I will guide you through, Rather than jumping in the car of our thought and driving off in another direction, we start to notice our thoughts like cars driving by and we acknowledge, okay, that was a thought. And then we come back to the breath or back to the body scan or back to whatever is happening in that present moment. So it really is a practice of presence. And in the same way that doing push-ups for the very first time, you might not feel strong. In fact, you might actually feel kind of weak the repetition builds strength. And the same thing can happen with our brain and with our mind. So thank you for being here. Know that wandering thoughts are normal, but we will do our best to kind of almost still the chatter 
and a moment to check in. So find a comfortable seat. You might adjust a bit. You might roll out your shoulders, take a stretch after the time you've spent in front of the screen. I invite you to place your hands either on your thighs, maybe face down for a feeling of groundedness, or maybe face up for kind of a signal of openness and being receptive. So whatever you need most today. And from here, just notice your feet grounding down. Notice where your physical body is connected to wherever you are sitting. And if closing your eyes does not resonate with you today for any reason, you might gently take your gaze to the tip of your nose. And from here, I invite you to take an expansive deep breath in, fill up your lungs, expand through your rib cage. You might even feel yourself getting a bit taller. And big open mouth, exhale. <sighs> feel your shoulders drop down away from your ears. Again, breathing in, find length in your spine. Imagine there's space between your earlobes and your collarbones. And then big sigh out, keep that length, but can you feel a heaviness in your sits bones, really letting your seat support you and hold you up. One more like that expansive, long, smooth breath in. Hold it for a moment at the top, maybe sip in one more inch of air. Big sigh out. Ha. <sighs> And now simply allow your breath to exist and ebb and flow without manipulating it or controlling it. Can the breath just be as it is? And even with the breath simply existing, can you still bring awareness to it? So notice how it feels. Maybe there's cool air against your nostrils as you inhale. Maybe there's a feeling of settling in and grounding as you exhale. And see if you can soften the space between your upper and lower teeth and allow your jaw to gently relax as your tongue rests at the bottom of your mouth. Notice if you could become even just 5% more physically relaxed in any area of your body. Starting at the crown of your head, once you start to notice and scan and bring awareness across your facial muscles, down your neck, could there be even just a small amount of release as you scan across your shoulders, down your arms, all the way to your hands, bringing awareness and just noticing your heart space wrapping around to your upper back, all the way down your spine, wrapping forward toward your belly. Can you soften any unnecessary holding or sucking in or engagement of your core? And can you allow the whole midsection of your body to simply ease into relaxation? down toward your legs. Notice your thighs softening down toward your kneecaps, all the way down your calves and toward your feet. All the while just bringing awareness to how your breath might help soften any areas that are asking for more release. And I invite you now 
to bring to mind one thing that you are grateful for today. This can be something small, just picking one thing that you feel a sense of gratitude and appreciation for. And if nothing comes to mind, maybe you find appreciation for this moment that we are sharing together, appreciation for your breath, appreciation for the opportunity to go inward and nurture your own self. As you bring to mind the thing that you are thankful for, can you notice what feeling that thought starts to emit? So can the feeling of gratitude start to feel present right at your heart space? Allowing that feeling to expand maybe even as a color. If your gratitude could be represented by a color, what color might that be? And as you really focus on the feeling of gratitude, on the feelings that the thoughts of your gratitude creates, can you start to feel that presence of gratitude expand from your heart space all the way down your spine toward your legs, continuing to radiate up your body toward your arms, your neck, and the crown of your head? And if it's helpful, maybe visualizing that gratitude in the form of a color and visualizing your entire body pulsating with that bright color. If you notice your mind wandering towards something totally natural, but invite yourself back. You might even think to yourself as you inhale, I am. Exhale, right here. Or inhale, I feel. Exhale, abundant with gratitude. So I'm going to allow my voice to drop out for just one minute, 60 seconds for you to choose whether it's the mantra, I am right here. I feel abundant with gratitude, or maybe it's the visualization of the color or maybe focusing on your breath, but choosing something to help anchor you for the next minute as you have the opportunity to be with your own self in stillness, in quiet. And I will guide you out when it is time. Inviting yourself with a deep breath in, back to this moment, deep breath out, 
and remembering that the practice is not about never thinking, but practicing concentration, practicing focus, practicing the feeling of gratitude and being able to set aside time for that practice to take place. So really taking your time, you might start with deepening your breath, maybe taking some gentle neck circles or tilt side to side, and then maybe reorienting yourself back into your space by not looking at the screen at first, but just noticing what's around you, noticing the colors in your room. And remembering that the practice is all about practicing. And so whatever did or did not happen, trust that the work is being done and the benefits are there for you. Take a really deep breath in through your nose. Big sigh out, taking this groundedness, this sensation of gratitude with you throughout the rest of your day. And thank you so much for joining me.